right, so we are on. And I'll put it to I, you. I uh, I have so much respect for how Neil Peart decided to privatize his life at the end, right? Not a lot of people knew he was sick. Everybody knew that his body was giving out and that he was tired and he wanted to quit music. But it was clear that he was still loved music. He just couldn't do it anymore. Um, and I, I think it's it. A lot of musicians die and a lot of people pass away. And I never really get choked up about it because people die. Mm -hmm. People get old and they die. That's just a natural part of it. I think for me with Neil Peart, the impact that he had on me as a little kid, I want to say I was about nine, ten. First time I ever heard a Rush lyrics on Permanent Waves. Maybe I was 11. Um, I, it was life changing for me. I, I don't think I would be a writer without Neil Peart, honestly. I, he made me love language. Now, I'm the non-Rush fan in the room. So right. can you, for people like me, you know, who maybe heard Rush songs in the radio, but don't really know much about his role in the band, why yeah. is he connected to the lyrics? What's the significance? But he was the lyrics writer as soon as he joined the band, right? He, he wrote all the lyrics on Caress of Steel and on... Uh, what was a, what was the one after that? Was that twenty one twelve? Was right after that? I don't know. They didn't do anything in between. Yeah, so he wrote all the lyrics on Crest of Steel, which confused people because it was so deep. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote all the lyrics on uh, twenty one twelve, and that was what changed the band forever, and that solidified them as real progressive rock. Um, and it was Getty and Alex who would come in and do the compositions and the. Uh, the, the alignments and everything else present the, the tunes, but then Neil would come right back in with all this drum arrangements. So, uh, Neil's, Neil's role 99% of the time was writing the lyrics first now, and then did, build did songs he write around all it. of the lyrics. Did Getty Lee contribute? Any Most lyrics? of the time, I think Getty would get one song per album that he'd write the lyrics for. He wrote the song, um, Tears on 2112, he wrote the song, uh, tr um, not Trees, what did he write? He eventually wrote um, Different Strings on Permanent Waves. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, he would have lyrics on an album. But Neil wrote them, almost all of them. Okay. And he was so literate. He was an autodidact. Um, he taught himself to do so many things. But he was also, he didn't like public life, and he didn't want to interact with the fans. It made him very uncomfortable. Okay. Well, I always um, heard he was a scientist or something. Was that true, or is that just something people? Said? I don't think he was a scientist, but he I, was self-taught about a lot of stuff. Okay. I don't know why people. I used to hear all kinds of things. I didn't know anything about Rush, but I would always hear yeah. the drummer in Rush is like a scientist or this or that. <laughs> so, so the lead singer for Offspring is a biochemist. The that's lead a surprise. Singer, that is a the, huge surprise, considering how stupid their lyrics well, are. Yeah, well, that's and just like stupid. how the guy's overall vibe. Just doesn't yeah. seem doesn't scream biochemist yeah. to me. Um, he's actually working on a cure for something right now. That's his scientific thing that he's worked on. The lead singer of Bad Religion has a doctorate in anthropology and zoology from Cornell or from UCLA, and he's teaching at Cornell. Um, so there's lots of people in music. The lead lead singer for the Jenna Tortures, she has a doctorate in medicine. Um, now how she became a punk rock singer is anybody's guess, but I'm always surprised at the people you find out how strong their background is in education in addition to being in music because they seem like completely divergent paths. Well, I think, um, I, I mean, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but I, you know, a, I've, I've, a lot of people that play guitar, you know, are, uh, you know, they they learned in college and stuff. Do you know what I mean it's not like it's not like uh, uh, you know there's no I, I think I think I think people assume most musicians are are not college educated for some reason. But there's not I, I don't know if there's any connection or disconnection between the two. Do you know what I mean? Like no. Well, I just think that the lifestyles themselves don't align. If you're a musician oh, and you saying. sleep all day, right? or if you're only self-reflective and you just want to work on mastering a, a, an instrument, that makes it very difficult to also go to college. I think, but you know what? A lot of what music is, is sitting in a room on your own writing music. 
Do you know what right. I mean? And it's very introspective and self-reflective. So I think that a lot of the tools that people develop with music are similar to the tools you use in school. Um, but I mean, there is uh, a, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I don't want to go ahead. No, I just remember Tom Morello from uh, Rage Against the Machine. He has a degree from Harvard in political science. And uh, Brian May is like an astrophysicist or something. But that came, I think he stopped. Yeah. And then yeah, he brought but... it after. Yeah. Um, which I don't know if, the, I don't know, is that different or is that the same? I, I always wondered if that's like the guys who come back when they're 50 and get their black belt, you know, like. Is it, uh, um, but I think any time that you can better yourself, I think it doesn't matter what age you are. Mm -hmm. My my next door neighbor, her name is Daisy. She's 70 plus years old. She has a fifth degree black belt in Kung Fu or Judo or something. She was unclear. How, how old she, is she? 75. Oh. That's... She teaches it on the side. It's I'd insane. be nervous. Throw, like you said Judo? Yeah. I'd be really nervous throw, like hip throwing a 75 year old. Yeah. Uh, well, she teaches. So I guess she does the hip throwing. Okay. And okay. then you go practice on somebody. But yeah. Okay. okay. That's different. That's different. But yeah, I no, haven't been to a class, so I don't know how she does I it. I mean, but... I've had old teachers. I've had old teachers. But but I'm talking about people that go back. Like they had a yellow belt or green right. belt. And then they, they get it at a later. You know, there's, it's got a little bit less, you know. Well, I've only yeah. known her as an old woman. So in my head, she got the last degree at an old age. Oh, I get you. Okay. <laughs> but maybe she got it when she was much younger. I don't know. Okay. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. With, with Rush, I'm, I, I don't really know much about them. They, they were never, they were never a band. Like, I'm not going to lie and say they were a band that, that I could have got into. I think their sound, it was always one notch to the side of what I liked, whatever that is. Do you know what I mean? Like, it just, I could recognize the quality of it, but I just could never get into it. Um, but I'm curious, you know, like their fans are so into what they do. Yeah. What is it about Rush that makes people so crazy for them? How it's it's really hard to pin down. There's been so many documentaries about this, but how do you pin it down? I mean, they're just they're just so I think honest and dedicated to perfection and doing to the art, right? Mm -hmm. They just love making the music and they were never those guys that wanted to get big. They didn't care if this didn't work out for them. They always said, well, we'll just go back to selling house paint. Okay. Um, and so I think a lot of people just respect the musicianship and the hard work and the, and the, uh, the, the work ethic that went into it which was very different from, you know, Kiss put on a great show, mm -hmm. but you can tell those songs weren't hard to write. And that's who they were competing against at the time period, right? There were a lot of bands who were just going through the motions. And Rush was never that band. So what about, like, I'm going to say, because this is the metal show, What's their contribution to metal? Because I mean, I don't think of them as a metal band. I think of them as more of a progressive rock band. Maybe I'm wrong, and you can correct me. Um, but they are a progressive rock band. But obviously, they've had an impact on metal, though. So, like, what? I don't the... think you can find a metal band in the '80s and '90s that wasn't impacted by Rush. It, that would be impossible, hmm. right? Because even if you weren't into progressive rock, you knew everything Rush was doing as a, somebody growing up in the '70s. And 80s, right? You knew if you were a musician, you knew what Rush was doing. You listened to their stuff. You listened to how complicated. You listened to Neil's impact on drumming. You listened to the work that Getty was doing, that Alex was doing. That was a three-man band, and they sounded like a 20-piece orchestra. That, right? that, that has fascinated me. When I found out that there were only three people playing instruments, yeah, you know that. Uh, now, but again, is that because they were recording multiple layers, or were they just figuring out? how to make those three instruments sound as big as they could. Do you they know were, mean? they were trying to make those three instruments sound as big as they could. Right. They, Cause they had to play this stuff live. Okay. okay. Getty Lee had to figure out a way to move the microphone with his nose on stage between certain parts of songs where he was going from playing the bass to playing the keyboards. Mm. Right. He had to figure out how to do all that to make those compositions work. Um, that's the kind of band that they were. So Getty Lee played 
Key keyboards as well. Keyboards, bass, and lead vocals. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So he's pro- so he's so when you say he could, because a lot of times if you say somebody who played bass was writing with the guitarist, mentally I would tend to assume the guitarist is doing a lot of the work. But if he played the keyboards, now I'm starting to wonder, was he like he he has a pretty firm musical background it sounds like like oh yeah yeah getty lee started on a regular guitar before he went to bass okay okay um, and getty was writing most of the music wrong right along the song alex right they were doing it all together okay. he wasn't just let me just throw down a bass line with you okay. they were making those compositions together and and i don't want to disparage all bassists because i know that probably just came out that way like <laughs> obviously steve harris is this bassist who writes tremendous songs but I right. guess what I'm saying is there are two kinds of bassists in the world. There are bassists sure, sure. who are playing bass because they want to be in a band and it's the it's the easier instrument. You don't have to play quite as much. And then there are bassists, bassists like Cliff Burton and stuff who have a much deeper musical background and come to it and can contribute things well beyond the bass playing to the band. Um, and so it, it just struck me that he seems to be in that category of bassist based on what you're saying. Um so so how did how did he die exactly oh brain cancer brain cancer okay yeah yeah he was fighting it apparently for three years well they had announced three years ago that they were over right didn't they say yeah yeah but he had left the band because he said his body was giving out Uh it was just too painful to tour anymore Oh, because he's that i mean you've heard his drumming at the very least so you know how hard he plays and it, it was just too much for him anymore okay no, that's uh, well. What I, again? I'm not a Rush fan, but I saw an interview with Getty Lee when they announced that around yeah. the time that they announced it, and I don't think he mentioned anything about the drummer being sick at all. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. He didn't publicize it. We didn't okay. know he had cancer until he passed away. Oh, so it was that. I thought he was just being private, is what you meant. So they this was like a this was kind of like news to the fans when it was announced. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Because we just thought, okay, well, he's old, he's retiring, that's fine. And everybody was sad, but nobody was being a dick about it, saying, oh, Neil Peart mm-hmm. betrayed us. Because they, they gave us 40 years of music. How can you be mad about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, people sometimes are jerks about that. When, like, a guy can't move his hands anymore. And yeah. they want they want to make the person play, uh, and they just can't, you know. It's... Wrestling fans are really bad about that. Are they? That's, yeah, because they want to be the they want to be the show that you ended your career on, right? Mm. Bumfuck Idaho wants you to end your career in Bumfuck Idaho. So when they don't get to see you coming through their town anymore, oh, that fucking Jake the Snake Roberts, he retired too soon. Really? That's yeah. yeah. That's Wrestling like, that's fans a, are like that, definitely. I mean, and that's like that sport destroys your body too, right? Like that's uh, absolutely yeah, yeah. People die early because of that thing. Yeah, they've all. I've noticed that that wrestlers seem to all be dying in like their fifties and sixties. Yeah, and concussions leads to CTE, leads to death. Mm. It's that simple. Or for the fatter wrestlers, heart disease. I always assumed steroids was part of the heart thing too. Uh, well, steroids was just such a short period of time for wrestling. Oh, so that what I always assumed that they just were all doing it all like no, like, like so like The Rock wasn't doing steroids and like no, okay. See, I, I, steroids was already out of wrestling by the late nineties because they'd already okay. been busted by the government. Okay, I'm one of these people that if like somebody's bigger than me, I'm just assuming they're on steroids. You know, <laughs> like nobody can get that big. I well, can't if get that Rock big. was doing it, it wasn't public, yeah. and he was passing his okay. health, his physicals. Okay. So if they caught you because they had been sued by the government mm. and big time. Um, if you were caught after that, that you were kicked out of wrestling. Okay. First time was a 30 day suspension. Second time you're done. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's yeah. seriously. So I think the only way rock could have passed it is simply because the rock is so big. They can't afford to lose him. Okay. So somebody would have been, but again, there's probably no reason to suspect that he over anybody right. else would have been. So. I'm sure there's all kinds of indie wrestlers who are doing steroids before they get into wrestling. Right. To build up their bodies. But, once you're there, I mean, it is, it, if it's happening, it's not happening as flagrantly and out in the open as it used to. Okay. And most wrestlers today are actually kind of small. I've no, I've actually noticed that. I've noticed that there's like a, a trend towards smaller, I mean, subjectively against the older yeah. wrestlers. They're right. still, right. They still seem pretty big compared to most people, but they're not 
these giants that they used to be, it seems. Yeah. Um, Anybody that is a big, massive brute in wrestling is naturally that big because they're 20 feet tall and they were always 20 feet tall. Is the shift to smaller people because they like having like more athletic, acrobatic type feats and smaller people can do the that sort indie, of thing? The indie leagues are producing smaller wrestlers. Mm -hmm. And when those indie leagues are promoting guys up into the WWE, that's who you're getting. Okay. Got, got, got somebody like CM Punk really was the, the progenitor for this movement of smaller wrestlers, guys like AJ Styles. Um, even if you go back, back as far as Shawn Michaels, who was the first ever star that was small, it's because the indie movement is... So many people want to get into wrestling, and the indie movement is accepting smaller and smaller guys. Um, okay, okay, so, but there's not... So there's not, like, a practical reason though in, in the ring or anything like that well no it's actually bad for your body to be too small you need a little bit of fat on you to protect your back oh um, okay wait what you need fat to protect your back wait. yeah a lot of these guys when they're doing their falls if they have more fat on their body overall it, it uh long term you're better off being fat to to absorb some of that oh okay absorb some of the hit to your spine um so for, from a health perspective you want a little bit of fat on you. But from a presentation and aesthetic perspective, people want to see thin wrestlers. They want to see in shape wrestlers. Okay. That's, yeah, I, that seems like, I mean, the more that we learn about what becomes of wrestlers, just the, I, I never yeah. thought of it as the brutal sport because, you know, it's got so much choreography to it. You, you know, you, you sort of dismiss the, the, you know, how brutal it is, but it, it yeah. It sounds like they're coming out worse than like MMA fighters and stuff, you know. Um, Mick Foley got an X-ray of his back once, and uh, he had uh, there were two bones that were white on the X-ray, and he's looking at it and he says, "Oh, Doc, my back looks great. I've only got two damaged bones." And the doctor says, "No, those are the only two that are good." <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ! Oh. Oh. Yeah, sometimes so that kind of knowledge. Is worse to have than not. Yeah, exactly. He was probably would have been a lot heavier, uh, a lot happier if he had uh, not never asked that question. Well, you don't want to suddenly know how brittle you are. Do you know what I yeah. mean? <laughs> it's, it's, you're just you're just gonna you're gonna feel it, and you're gonna it's gonna be there when it's not. You know, if you if you know about it. Yeah, uh, Mick Foley might be the most ravaged wrestler of all time. Probably him and Abdullah, and I forget the other guy's name. This uh, this really violent wrestler from the indie scene. But Abdullah the Butcher was just covered in scars when he finally passed away. And Mick Foley, who's still alive, he can barely walk anymore. He's missing a bunch of teeth. He's missing an ear. And his back is just what shattered. What happened to his ear? He lost it in a match when he tried to yank his head out of the ropes. He oh, panicked, Jesus which you shouldn't Christ. do because it's really easy to get out of the ropes yeah. when you're tangled up. But oh, they were like wrapped in. around him like that or yeah. something? Okay. His arms were linked in there. And uh, he panicked for because instinct human yeah. instinct not wrestling instinct kicked in and he yanked himself out and his left ear got ripped off as he was coming out of the ropes oh that's that's nasty yeah it doesn't sound good but oh well you know i guess from neil pert to wrestling without an ear you know quite so, the episode yeah so i don't know any other thoughts on neil pert before we, we no i just he's I only have a few muses in my life. I don't go talking about them. I never talk about my heroes online or anything like that. Um, and now that Neil's gone, I have to say that without him, I would not be doing what I'm doing. He made me love language, honestly. Right, so I, I, I think that's the hugest testament to somebody that somebody like that can be is to influence other people to want to do something. And so even if you don't like somebody's work, if they're impacting you in any way, well, and had he is the drummer who wrote lyrics, and the, that someone like that motivated you to become a writer says a lot yeah. about you know the quality of the lyrics. I would say um, so. That's probably a good place to end, um, and I guess we'll be back you know with more stuff later.